Well, we've uh, been going through 1 Corinthians uh, and we saw in chapter 7 that Paul has been answering the questions that the Corinthian Christians have raised in the letter that they'd written to him. Go back to uh, chapter 7 and verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about. And these matters that they wrote about to Paul in chapter 7 revolved around personal relationships between a, a husband and wife, to those considering getting married, to those considering getting remarried if they had been widowed. And Paul has reiterated the Lord Jesus' teaching where Jesus had spoken on the issue in hand. Where Jesus hadn't spoken, well, Paul gives his own teaching. On other occasions, as we saw uh, last week, he's just given the Corinthian church the benefit of his advice. He's not laid down any binding rules. And now, at the beginning of chapter 8, Paul comes to yet another issue which the Corinthian Christians have brought to his attention. We see that there in verse 1. Now about food sacrificed to idols. Now this problem the Corinthian Christians were facing in the first century seems pretty remote to us in the 21st century. We do not face the problem of food sacrificed to idols just like those in the ancient world did not face the problem of a poor mobile phone reception in certain black spots. You might be tempted to think then, how on earth is this going to be relevant to us today? This passage is going to be about as helpful to us as a bike is to a fish. But the underlying issue Paul is addressing is not so much the issue of food sacrificed to idols but the issue of Christian liberty versus Christian responsibility. It's the issue of a Christian exercising his or her rights over and against his or her responsibility towards other Christians. In other words a Christian may have the right to do something, but is this course of action, which is his or her prerogative, also at the same time showing consideration towards his brothers and sisters? Now in chapter 6, Paul has already quoted the words of the Corinthians back to them. Chapter 6 and verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say. But then Paul adds, but not everything is beneficial. And he will repeat this, their assertion back to them again in chapter 10. I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial, Paul adds. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. And the Corinthian Christians have been making much of their rights. But what about their responsibilities. Paul therefore in these next three chapters, 8, 9 and 10, is taking on the issue of a Christian's rights balanced against his responsibilities. This then is the context for this morning's message which I have entitled Head and Heart. Head and Heart. Some of the Corinthians were flaunting their head knowledge. They were making much of what they knew or what they thought they knew. They were airing their knowledge. They were claiming to be in the know. But their knowledge had not yet touched their hearts. Theological knowledge is not an end in itself, contends Paul. No, it must lead to something more. Theological knowledge must affect the heart. It must affect how the Christian behaves. If theological knowledge, however sound, does not lead to loving behaviour towards our spiritual brothers and sisters, it is in vain. I've got two headings for you this morning. And I would like to take 
verse 4 to 6 first and briefly outline what those in the know knew. What those in the know knew. Well, what did those in the know know in Corinth? Well, actually, they knew some things worth knowing. They had gained some invaluable theological insight. And Paul is not disagreeing at all with what the Corinthians in the know knew. In fact, in verses 4 to 6, he affirms what they knew. He quotes what they said they knew back to them and then expands on their knowledge. Firstly, they knew that an idol is a non-entity. The Roman Empire was overrun with idols. It was pervaded by idols. Immediately before Paul came to Corinth, he'd been in Athens. And Luke records that he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. There was even an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. And we get the impression that the Athenians had done their best to make an altar to every God they could possibly think of. When it came to the gods, they wanted to have every base covered. However, they were fearful that they had overlooked one God and thus offended him. Therefore, they had made this particular altar to placate him. But those in the know at Corinth knew that idols were not real. The gods the idols represented only existed in people's minds. The idol may have looked impressive, it may have been made of a precious material, it may have had attractive design features, but it was all style. There was no substance behind the idol. How could there be? It was the image of a God that had no reality. In his farewell speech to Israel at Gilgal, Samuel, the last judge of Israel, warned the people, do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. Do idols exist today? Well, yes, of course, but they do so in subtler forms. There's a saying, isn't there? The graveyards are full of indispensable men. These men made themselves seemingly indispensable in their places of employment. They made work their idol. Their work was what they lived for that their idol could do nothing to prevent them from meeting their final appointment with death. Overwork may have even contributed to their death. Some people have the football club that they support as their idol. The football ground where their team plays is their place of worship. The turf on which the team plays is therefore sacred in their eyes. So when the supporter dies, they ask, for the ashes to be scattered on the hallowed grass. But of course, the football club is in no way divine. The grass on the pitch is just grass, nothing more. So idols do exist, but they're useless. They cannot overcome the problem of death. Idols are not gods. They are non-entities. And those in the know in Corinth knew this, as do those in the church today, with any sort of biblical theology. Therefore, how can an idol of an imaginary God possibly have corrupted the food a believer is about to eat? How could food be defiled by a God which does not exist? It cannot be. And in verse 8, Paul plainly states, it's just food, it's just food. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. And those in the know in Corinth knew this. But those in the know also knew there is but one God, the Father, verse 6. 
Those in the know in Corinth knew that there was not a plethora of real gods competing for a person's attention. No, there was only one real God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Verse 4, there is no God but one. Well, that's a saying that Paul has adapted from the Shema, from Deuteronomy 6. That was the most important prayer a Jew could pray. See it here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He is the one true God. The, one, the Lord is the one to be worshipped, obeyed and served. He alone was and is and will be. And all the other gods are non-gods. Only the God who is spirit is real. And he's unique. And through the lips of the prophet Isaiah, he declares, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. So those in the know in Corinth know there is but one God, the Father. But there's a third vital piece of information, of knowledge, those in the know in Corinth also knew. Namely, namely, the Lord Jesus Christ is co-equal with God the Father. He is co-unique with God the Father. And in verse 6, Paul gives an unequivocal statement about the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those in the know know that Jesus is the physical manifestation of the God who is spirit. They know that Jesus, the Son of God, is the image of the invisible God. They recognize, as Thomas did after the Lord Jesus appeared to him a week after he had first appeared to his fellow disciples, that Jesus is both Lord and God. If all things created, if all things spiritual, verse 6, are from the Father, they are through the Son. The Father is the source of all things, but the Son is the agent of all things. If we live for God, we live that life through Christ. Everything which comes from the Father comes through Christ, the Son. This thing is head knowledge worth knowing. Idols are non-entities, there's nothing in them. They're images of God which do not exist, only in the minds of people. Food sacrificed to gods which do not exist, therefore has not been tainted. It's just food. But there is but one God who has revealed himself initially to Israel, his special people, and then there is but one Lord Jesus Christ through whom the God of historic Israel has now revealed himself to all peoples. What those in the know in Corinth knew. But now we see in verses 1 to 3 what those in the know didn't know. What those in the know didn't know. You know, there is no virtue in ignorance. It's imperative to grasp the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith, to understand basic Christian doctrine, to possess theological knowledge. To make progress in the Christian faith, well, we need knowledge. But Paul says knowledge in itself is not enough. In fact, there are some severe limitations to knowledge. And he has therefore a word of caution to those in Corinth who claim to be in the know. He has a word of admonishment to those in Corinth who were flaunting their knowledge or what they thought they knew to others in the church. And those in the know did not know firstly that there is a huge difference between knowing about God and knowing God. There is all the difference in the world between possessing theological knowledge and enjoying a personal walk with God. The Christian faith, at the end of the day, is not so much theological, but relational. It's not knowing theological facts, but possessing a living faith in the Lord Jesus. When I began my studies at that esteemed academic institution, Portsmouth Polytechnic, 
in 1980 to study the German language, history and culture. On the reading list was a book entitled simply Facts About Germany. And the book was exactly what it said it was on the cover. Facts about Germany, West Germany, actually, in those days. And it gave useful information about West Germany, its population, its literacy levels, its capital, its political system, etc. But I really did not know anything about the German way of life from personal experience because I'd never been to Germany or had lived among the Germans up to that point. All I knew was facts about Germany. Therefore, there is all the difference between what you read in a book about a country and having lived there yourself. One involves facts, the other experience. And those in the know in Corinth were parading their knowledge about God, but in reality, their experience of God in their lives was very shallow. It was theoretical, not relational. And this is what Paul is getting at in verse 3. But whoever loves God is known by God. And this leads us secondly to something else very important that those in the know didn't know. Namely, the purpose of theological knowledge is to regenerate the heart. And we come back to what has already been said because it's so important. The accumulation of knowledge is not an end in itself. Now that's, that's true in life, isn't it? You do not study medicine just to acquire medical facts. You do not take exams just to get the accreditation that you've qualified as a doctor. No, you study to pass exams so that you can practice as a doctor, so that you can be of use to others, so that you can facilitate healing where there is sickness or disease. And in the same way, at the end of all doctrine should be application. At the end of all a Christian belief should be practice. There should be an impact on his or her living. The triune God of Father, Son and Holy Spirit is not a, a collection of data to be studied and poured over. No, it's the Godhead to be loved, worshipped and adored. It's the Godhead in Charles Wesley's words, in whom to be lost in wonder, love and praise. The point of knowing the gospel is to transform our hearts and not to swell our heads. It's to regenerate our hearts of stone into hearts of love for God embodied by hearts which love others, especially our Christian brothers and sisters. It's just as the Apostle John challenges his readers in his first letter. How can we say that we love the God we have not seen if we do not love the brothers and sisters in Christ we have seen? Living Christianity then is about the full heart, not the full head. It's about the heart overflowing with love. It's about the heart being regenerated by love. It is not about the head swollen by theological knowledge. It is knowledge which puffs up the one in possession of it, where it's the loving Christian who seeks to build up others in the faith. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Who will be among the most honoured in the kingdom of God? Well, it will not be those who make it their habit to showcase what they know, what great teachers they have sat under, what courses they have attended, what books they have read. No, it will be those unassuming saints who have quietly applied the teaching they have received and have gone on to love and serve and edify others. Some of the most compelling Christian people I have known over the years have never been to theological college, have never been acquainted with the finer points of evangelical theology and have never preached a sermon. 
But their spiritual stature was obvious. They were people who knew their God and driven by hearts of love, they built up others in the church. But those in the know in Corinth were also ignorant of some other important things. Those in the know didn't know, thirdly, that possessing certain knowledge about God only reveals what we don't know about God. You see, these Corinthians in the know thought that they had arrived. They thought that they were members of a privileged spiritual elite. They prided themselves that they had received revelation others in the church hadn't. They flattered themselves that they knew things others in the church didn't. But what those in the know were blind to was that their knowledge was at best partial. Their knowledge was fragmentary. Their knowledge in the overall scheme of things was in fact next to nothing. How could it be otherwise? The God they claimed they had received revelation from could not be put under a microscope or and be dissected. He could not be put in a cage and brought out for examination. The God they claimed they were in the know about is infinite, is unfathomable, is inscrutable, and is beyond fully knowing. In God's own words through Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Those in the know in Corinth thought they knew everything there was to know about God, when in reality they had barely scratched the surface. You know, the really knowledgeable person in any field in life the expert knows how little he or she actually knows compared with all there is out there to be known. They know just how much more there is to learn, how much more there is to discover. How much more then must this be the case when the subject matter is the God who in the words of the psalmist is from everlasting to everlasting God. Therefore, Paul could write of these Corinthians in the know in verse 2. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. The spiritual know-it-all reveals how very little they actually know, despite all their great boasting. Lastly, those in the know at Corinth didn't know that God reveals himself to the humble and to the contrite. Genuine humility and contrition over sin are the prerequisites for knowing and being known by God. Jesus was on a preaching tour of Galilee and he exclaimed, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. It's our verse for the week on the back of the notice sheet. And this is what Yahweh, the Lord, declares about himself through Isaiah, his prophet. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Paul, however, found neither lowliness nor contrition among those in the know in Corinth. It's been well said that while some Christians grow in love, others just swell in pride. And this was the condition of the Corinth who claimed to be in the know. They were puffed up, they were inflated, they were arrogant, they were swollen by the pride emanating from what they thought they knew. What those in the know knew, what those in the know didn't know. Now we know, don't we, that in life, knowledge is power. An employee's value to his employer is proportionate to the knowledge he or she possesses. If the employee knows a lot about the business, its products, its procedures, its computer systems, 
Generally speaking, an employer is loath to see him or her go. An employer is likely to offer inducements for them to stay. But the knowledge is power attitude belongs in the world and not in the body of Christ, the church. That kind of attitude in the church is dangerous. It swells the head, it doesn't soften the heart. It fills the head with pride, it doesn't overflow the heart with love. It makes those in the know look down on those not in the know. And Paul was afraid that this was the case in Corinth when it came to the subject of food sacrificed to idols. And he was concerned that those who knew an idol was a non-entity were not behaving very graciously towards those in the church to whom idols presented a very real problem, to whom food sacrificed to idols posed a stumbling block. Paul's point, therefore, is what we learn in our heads must regenerate our hearts. What we know must translate into how we behave. In this case, those with insight must be gracious towards those with rather less insight. In his great treatise on the nature of agape love in chapter 13, Paul writes this, verse 4. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith which can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. Knowledge, then, without love is nothing. Knowledge without love is cold, not warm. Head knowledge that, that does not reach our hearts leads to conceit, whereas hot head knowledge which gets through to the heart ignites the love which is so constructive. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Paul believed in knowledge. Paul championed knowledge. Paul was a, a, a cheerleader for sound doctrine. He was dismayed when the, Corinthian, when the Galatian Christians abandoned their knowledge of the real gospel for a gospel which, in his words, was no gospel at all. But the point of knowledge is not to brag about what we know, <coughs> but to love God and others more perfectly. It's the knowledge of the truth which straightens us, but it is love which sweetens us. What then is more valuable in God's sight? Our knowledge of theology or our love for others? Well, it has to be our love. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Of course, we need to be head Christians, but we also need to be heart Christians even more. Amen.